Uh, welcome uh, to our session, Configuring ArcGIS Indoors to Optimize Your Workplace. Um, I'm going to introduce my colleagues. Uh, uh, again, Pat Wallace, I lead the Indoors Practice in our Professional Services Division. Is that right? Hi. Hi, uh, Max Spielkelis. Probably Max is easier to remember. Um, I am leading the professional services team in Vienna of the Indo.rs company that recently got acquired by Esri, um, specializing in the indoor positioning system. All right, thank you, Max. And hello, good morning. My name is Omar de la Riva, and I'm a consultant with uh, Pat on, on the indoors team. Good morning. So we have a lot of ground to cover. Uh, we'll have a few minutes at the end for some questions. Uh, diving in, indoors is full stack. It's, it's a complete uh, geo-enabled system for better understanding indoor environments, workplace environments, the, including the connective tissue between buildings, which normal people call outdoors. All right, so this is uh, an idea of our agenda. So I'll go ahead and uh, get started. Uh, some of you may have seen this. Raise your hand if you attended some of the earlier indoors sessions. So it looks like about 40% uh, of you. Uh, so for those that didn't, I'm going to give you a, a quick overview of why in the world are we doing uh, this indoors product. Uh, number one, it provides a common operating picture uh, for these workplace environments. Um, you may be saying, oh, well, I work at uh, a university. Well, that's a workplace too, right? And the, uh, the residents and occupants there are, are analogous to uh, you know, uh, employees at a large corporate campus, for example. They're the ones using those spaces all day long, every day, right? And in a similar fashion, they all have business operations teams. And in that sense, indoors is a window into these other business systems. Um, so that they can do things like improve service delivery across a number of various business lines, as well as uh, monitor continuity of operations across these various organizations. So, you know, high level, hey, it lets you better plan and allocate resources across your workplace, regardless of the context of that workplace. Think about it, there's a myriad of activities happening across these diff different business lines, and each of those activities require resources, fixed assets, uh, movable assets, or even human resources like, like us, right? Indoors lets you see all these things. Uh, so just because you're inside the envelope of a building doesn't mean that uh, it's, it's, uh, it's okay to continue thinking, oh, uh, I don't need any information in there because it's impossible to see in there. No, we, we let you see into those environments. So in terms of improving service delivery, I, I think we could uh, you know, comfortably say that if I can see into these environments and I can understand where these activities are and I can see proximate resources, I might, I might be able to deliver service more efficiently, right? Um, this is showing a connection to our uh, Survey123 uh, application uh, directly from uh, ArcGIS Indoors. At the uh, 1.1 release, uh, right about now for Android, uh, probably a few days uh, more for iOS, uh, you'll be able to see uh, an extension of that uh, using standard HTT uh, protocol. Uh, we can connect to any system with smart launch capabilities from, the, uh, from our uh, mobile apps. And by the end of the year, I think at 10.72, it'll be baked into the web application uh, coming with ArcGIS Enterprise. So uh, what else can we do in terms of uh, safety and security? Well, if I can see uh, the, the flow of devices uh, uh, and, and uh, managed assets through buildings, and I can see uh, where people are, um, you know, in terms of uh, secure areas and non-secure areas, I might be able to do a better job in terms of ensuring uh, that existing, existing activities continue uh, without any incidences that could uh, delay or hinder 
uh, those activities. And if there was a, a particular threat, we could flow in proximate resources uh, to support those planned activities. Uh, so again, ArcGIS indoors is a geo-enabled system. It has a lot of pieces. And I'm gonna go over, not just me, but me and my colleagues, we're gonna go over that today and give you a, a, a feel for the flavor of it. Um, it all rests on an underlying uh, information model. Uh, it's extensible, but not uh, detractable, right? So you can add you know, whatever spices you want on top, uh, whatever uh, additional properties, and you can lay it in indoors, and, and you can see those things. Uh, quick idea of uh, what, we're, what we have planned in uh, the rest of the year and uh, beyond 2019. And so we probably went into some more detail in some of the earlier sessions. All right, so let's, uh, let's jump into this. So I'm gonna give you an idea of uh, what it takes to get the web application set up. So uh, in terms of the uh, web application, I'm gonna, uh, I'm gonna actually change my presentation view real quick and uh, give you a quick idea. So I will duplicate here. So you should be able to see presenter mode. Okay, so this is, uh, how many of you saw the plenary presentation? All right, so uh, one of our customers, ExxonMobil, this is the same, same web application that we saw in that particular demonstration. Um, it has what we call a normal, yeah. Oh, sorry, I had that in duplicate. It didn't stick. Okay, that's really weird. <laughs> Okay, all right, I hope it stays. Um, so this is the web application, uh, just real quick for the functionality. If I refreshed it, it's gonna go back to its home location. So I just want you to watch the behavior. All right, cool. So if it recognizes your name as a name that you logged in with, it's gonna just automatically focus on, it knows, oh, this is my home location. Uh, but you could set it as anything, right? So. Um, you know, let's say I wanted to go to, I don't know, the first floor, uh, actually lower lobby, and we're gonna set it at this uh, security turnstile here, right? So let's say, uh, I don't know, we're gonna just set it in this room. I'm gonna set it as a home. And then uh, if I refreshed it, it would zoom to there. But uh, for the sake of continuing on with, the, with this presentation and showing the different behavior, I'm just gonna type in the word kiosk instead of index. And by default, it has two modes, right? It has the uh, fat button kiosk mode that you would put up on a touch screen display, right? And it, oh, you are here. Um, in our implementations, uh, we would recommend putting a separate point of interest in that location so you can be very precise in terms of the placement, right? And so you can see now I click on these things, I can dive into the different uh, points of interest. By the way, this is the only thing that I know of in the ArcGIS stack that has a way to manage points of interest, access them, search them, share them, for example. Uh, get directions to things, and then uh, if you have events, we can lay them in, make them accessible. We give you what I would call a human readable time slider, which is a calendar, so. Okay, so now you see the two modes. Um, I can go back to regular mode and show that it's also, um, let's make this a, like an iPhone 10 form factor, right? So let me make my screen a little smaller. That's weird. There. So that's pretty cool, right? So, what, I mean, you get most of the functionality of the mobile app, but what don't you get? You don't get the blue dot, right? Because it's not directly connected, you know, to the, uh, the operating system, it's through, through the browser. Um, what also do you not get? You do not get, uh, if I clicked events, you don't see the calendar piece here. So I don't have direct access to the calendar that's associated with my operating system. So if you did have location-enabled events in your calendar, 
um, we'd be able to see that in the mobile app. So you'll see that later. So let me uh, go back to the other mode here. All right. And back to our presentation. So that's what I meant by kiosk and computer. So uh, how do we deploy it? Um, at 10.7, uh, you, you get the installation fall, files from MyEsri. Uh, there's one called Indoors Data. Inside of it, uh, there's a, uh, a folder. Um, you, you can see this here. And what you'll want is the web. You copy that, right? And then uh, you know, at 10.7, you're going to go to your portal uh, instance. And then you're going to go into. Uh, you're going to go into the app folder on portal, paste it in there, give it a name that makes sense, right? I mean, it doesn't matter. Just give it a name. At 10.7.1, it's, it's slightly different. At 10.7.1, it comes with enterprise, right? So you don't have to do this stuff. It's just already packaged in. And what I'm saying only uh, is applicable if you want to create like four versions of the app, one for this team, one for this team, and one for the other team. So you have the default configurable app that comes with, and then you can make a copy of it, change the branding and the styling, and you know, do some other configuration things, give it a different app name, right? give it a different logo, and then that goes in another folder. So this may be a little, a little um, may not be as clear, but I'm going to get into it, and it should become clearer. Um, so at 10.7.1, uh, um, just you know, some. This is an example of what we did for the uh, the Exxon uh, presentation, right? So you can see I have the base indoors one that comes with uh, Portal, and then I made a copy of it and called it EM Blue, and another one called EM Resident. So it's not it's not rocket science. Now, uh, how do you make one blue and one red, right? Well, inside of uh, the the uh, folder, you'll find, a, uh, it, like in the styling folder, uh, there's a file uh, where you can update the, the CSS styling. Uh, so it essentially allows you to brand the application. I recommend using an IDE like PyCharm or, or something else so that you can directly click on the color, right? Do you see that? So if you're using a decent IDE, like a, a developer interface uh, to see uh, you know, the styling, you can just click on it, change the color. There's even a color picker in most of them now. And you could, if you had the website open, you could, you know, your company's website, you just click on it and you'd get the exact color. So no fat finger mistakes, right? Is that clear? All right. So um, there's another thing that you can update. There is a JSON config. Uh, what can you update? You could actually put in there like the location of my web map, the location of my scene. You could say, man, I hate your blue highlight boundary of brown buildings. I'm going to make it red because you know, my company's uh, you know, branding is red right? or it's yellow. So it's up to you. You, you can change things like that. And, um, you know, by default, it wires up the key uh, like uh, polygon uh, features like facilities, sites, levels to the search. So you don't have, and even units. So you don't have units or rooms. So you don't have to create a separate PI, POI for those things, points of interest. Um, but if you don't want to do that because there is some uh, processor time on that, right? It loops through those things on the search. You could pull them out, right? Um, so this is where you would do that. And you could even add in a, another one if you wanted to, right? So if you wanted to add in sections or something, you, you could do that. Um, if you don't like uh, the default icon that shows up for those things, because remember, these aren't points of interest. Remember when I went through the Explorer and they had all those icons in there, right? If, if it's not a default point of interest like that, there's just like this generic icon that shows up. And if you don't want a generic icon, you could use that, that structure, that JSON structure to add in your own icon. And you would just you know, add the URL here. OK, cool, because we're doing a lot of JSON configuration stuff right now, apparently. I'm, <laughs> I'm going to show you some more, right? So, um, so take a look at this. So when, when as soon as you uh, 
you know, you uh, let's say you want to add a new indoors app, right? And I want the blue app, and I've made, and I'm going to take the 1071 portal example, and uh, you know, so I make this new application, and and so how do I get it to show up as the item in portal? Where well, I go to my contents uh, in portal, and I and I make a new item, and I add it directly there, and I give the uh, I give the application a name, right? It gives it allows me to to specify a title for the application. And it could be like Pat's awesome indoor viewer. And then it's going to ask you for the URL for that application, and it's essentially the portal name, slash apps, slash, you know, the the name of the folder, right? So that's the only time that the name of the folder, if you're making an additional copy like the blue app, actually matters because users are going to see that name in the URL, right? So just remember, I mean, make a mental note so don't make a crazy name like rabbits indoors or something because then they'll look at it and go, well, that's kind of weird. And that was a weird example, I admit. But that's the first one that came to me. Um, so there's also a configuration setting because these are configurable apps. So how many of you have tried to, you have a web map, I mean, not, a, not an indoors web map, and you go, you, you know how in ArcGIS Online on Portal you click share and you can share it as a web application? How many of you tried that? All right, that's a good amount. So if you do that, you get some things that you can configure, right? You get a little box that goes, oh, you know, what do you want the name of this section to be? Or, you know, how many widgets do you want in here? Well, that's what this stuff is. This tells you, like, what is exposed as a configurable parameter inside of the ArcGIS Indoors application. So in the 10.7 version of the app, you don't get a lot. It's just like the location of the web map and the location of the scene. In the 10.7.1, you get more, right? You can put the location of your routing service and your closest facility service, uh, as well as your uh, link to the configurable 311, whether that's to survey 123 or, or something else, OK? So I know that was looking at a lot of weird JSON structure, but I just wanted to show you what that looks like, right? So once you set it up as a, a, an app template and you have a web map, you can click share, and just like I was saying, it shows up as a configurable uh, application. And you can preview it, and then you can go in and mess around and change the URLs, like, oh, I hated that web map. I want it to be this web map now. Or, oh, that routing service was terrible. Let's use this other one. So it just it makes life easier for you. All right. Um, and this kind of lets you see what's exposed. So I can select the map. I can select the scene. And I can just paste in the URL to, to these other components. All right. So configurable 311. Um, I will show you an example real quick. So let me get this plugged in. Apologies for the delay. And uh, I don't think the last time this was used was at the plenary, so we'll do this. All right, so if you saw the plenary presentation, you remember this part. We went to the conference room. Oh, we started having our meeting, but it was too cold. And so we clicked the 311 button, and boom, we can preload information into here uh, directly from ArcGIS indoors. So how did we do that, right? Well, there's a, we'll copy this, right? So I'm gonna go to uh, notes, make a new note for you. Uh, a new one. Okay, so, hey, Pat, that looks like a lot of gobbledygook, right? So, so what are we looking at here? We're looking at, uh, well, I have the link to the survey, right? Um, if it's on a portal, you, you know, it's a question mark uh, or ampersand, no, question mark portal URL, you list the portal URL. 
And then, and then you get into the uh, statements about what fields that I want to extract from ArcGIS and DOOR. So it's all ampersand this, ampersand that, right? So you can see ampersand, oh, field level name in the, in the web map. Um, you know, I'm gonna, I can set it at a specific value or I could point it, uh, you know, to, to uh, actually I got that backwards. So the, the field level name in the survey, I'm, in this particular example, I'm saying, oh, you equal zero two, right? But I could also say, you know, curly brackets, facilities dot, facility name, and it would extract the facility name from the facility layer in the web map, all right? And I'm gonna show you that in the next slide, but I just wanted to let you see, you know, what, what the uh, output looks like and how it calls survey one, two, three, and pours data into it. Okay, so we're gonna go back, and then I'll show you how this works. So this doc isn't published yet. It should be uh, out on the indoors, uh, on the indoors uh, help site in the next uh, in the next week or so. So this is a sneak peek. All right, at 10.7, like I said, it only works with survey one, two, three. You only get certain fields that you can extract: uh, facility room, section, uh, level name, and, and and that's it, right? So if you can you can do a lot with that, uh, but it is a limitation. Um, so you open an existing survey. Uh, if you want to edit an existing survey, I learned some new tricks. I want to share them with you. Uh, here's the secret words, right? So if you want to open an existing survey to a specific record, you can add this to the end of, of a survey and from 10.7 or 10.7.1. So question mark mode equals edit, and the object ID equals some object ID. Um, all right, the other thing that you can do that I recommend doing with the 311 is, uh, is you wanna set the location as, as, the, uh, as the, the X and Y that you are looking at in indoors, the X, Y, and Z. So this is the syntax to do that. So center equals shape dot Y, shape, shape dot X. And then be, this is a limitation with surveying one, two, three. You can't add the Z into it right now. Uh, so usually I'd want to pull that out in a separate field called Z, and Z equals this. And then there should be a closed curly brackets on that, but there's not. Um, at 10.7.1, this is where we can use like standard HTTP protocol and you know just pull out whatever data you want from your source map. So I think that's pretty cool. Um, is that pretty cool? I mean, it's kind of, Kind of nerdy, but it's pretty cool. Um, and then the other default behavior for survey one, two, three is still applicable, right? I do want to set the center point at what I was looking at in survey one, two, three, because that's just that's typically what you want to do. You may want to do something else, uh, but so survey one, two, three. If you're pouring data to survey one, two, three, it allows you to to do two types of points. One is the thing that you touched somewhere else or where it thinks you are. And another could be like something that you're looking at, and that's called a geo point. So we can, I can point you to the doc for that on survey one, two, three after the session if you want. And this is just an example of the base URL, like the differences. So let's just say we want to pull out unit name. That, that's how it would look. Does that make sense? I know it's, it's not even 11, so I hope it makes sense. All right, indoors mobile. Um, these are, the, these are the real differences between the web behavior and, the, and, and what you see in iOS and Android. So it is uh, the native apps, iOS and Android, indoor positioning, which we're gonna get into in a few minutes, integration with a calendar on your device. And uh, so I'm gonna just show that real quick. So we're gonna hop back over. And uh, Okay, so if I click schedule, right, I have two things. I have events and I have a calendar. Events and a calendar. So what's a calendar? A calendar is my calendar. It's like my stuff. I do it, I set it, I made it, 
or I accepted the appointment, right? Where does that come from? It comes from my calendar, right? That's, that's kind of what I was just saying. So I can see here I have Digital University and I, if I clicked into that uh, event, right, it, it has a location, right, in a location field. So as long as this value matches something that's in the map, we're gonna find it and allow you to access it. Okay, so that, that's all that we're saying. So that's where we got that information. And that's why if it shows up in my calendar and the location matches, I can just click on it and it takes me to it. So that's pretty cool. Um, the other thing is device tracking. Uh, how do I control that? Right, right here. So I could turn it on, I could turn it off, I could turn it on, I could turn it off. I could keep doing that for minutes. Um, <laughs> so um, the other thing that you can do is you can go into location settings. You guys know how to do this? Location settings on your phone, right? You may not, so this, this is like an o, OS, iOS, or even an Android tutorial. I can uh, type in location. Right, so I go into location, and I could just turn it off. I could turn all of it off, and I'd never get a blue dot in any application, not in Google Maps, Apple Maps, Banana Maps, whatever kind of maps, it doesn't matter. Uh, and I could click into uh, ArcGIS Indoors, and I can say, I want, you to, I want you to be able to access my location whenever, all the time, even when I'm sleeping, or never, um, or just when I'm using the app. So I, I like it only when I'm using the app, so I'm gonna get out and get back. And if I flip this switch again, and I just leave that on, and in the underlying map, and it's not even gonna let, oh, there we go. So device location has to be on. If that's on, then I can share my location because it takes it and it posts it to somewhere. So you have a couple options in the ArcGIS Indoors Universe. You can create a custom feature service. We provided provide a template in that program's data folder that comes with ArcGIS Indoors, and you just upload the blank geodatabase to, ArcG to ArcGIS Enterprise. It kicks off a feature service, and then this will just post data to that feature service. And you, you paste that URL into a configuration file with your map. If you don't wanna do that, you just use the location tracking that's available across all of ArcGIS indoors. So how many of you have played with location tracking uh, with ArcGIS Enterprise? Three of you, okay. So I'll, uh, I'm gonna show you that real quick. It's not uh, too terribly difficult. All right, so here we go. So let's get back to my portal, right? Yeah, I'm about to switch. Okay, so we're back to my portal. I made the screen really small. I don't know why. And if I go to my organization, right, and I go to settings, so I'm admin. If you're not admin, you're not gonna see this. And there's a new tab here called location tracking. And you just enable it. This isn't just an indoors thing, this is an ArcGIS thing. So as long as you turn it on, this indoors can just post data to location tracking. And, and where does it show up? Well, it shows up as a, um, a service. You need a, a big data store, the spatio-temporal big data store, right? So I'm gonna type in location. Here it is, right? And there's, it comes with two layers. So I'm gonna hop, what are they? They're uh, tracks and last known locations. So that's what it captures, right? So. That's uh, how we do that inside of, uh, let me hop back to, I know I'm hopping back and forth in between, but I wanna show you how this works. So if you turn it on and the username matches, the username here and the username in the portal, what happens? So 
if you didn't see the plenary presentation, you wouldn't see, wouldn't have seen this. So I could look for my colleague, Pam Riggs, and we're sharing location with each other, right? And we can create different track view groups. So we could set it up team by team. These teams need to collaborate with each other. And so I could see, oh, Pam Riggs, her assigned seat is here, but her last known was actually somewhere else, right? So that's how this works. All right, so back into the presentation. And, uh, and now we're to indoor positioning. So I'm gonna start by talking about the uh, indoor positioning. Let me go to presenter mode. Actually, let me uh, extend. Make it a nice and pretty presentation here. So we recognize three types of location uh, in the mobile applications, uh, Bluetooth-based positioning, Wi-Fi-based positioning, and GPS, right? So if you're not always inside, you go outdoors in between buildings. You want the dot to make sense when you look at it in the application. Um, we natively recognize the Apple indoor positioning and uh, I'm gonna talk a little bit about how that works. It provides GPS level accuracy uh, it, at the floor level, okay? So just think about it that way. It's Wi-Fi based, so it doesn't require any additional infrastructure on your part. I mean, most of everything nowadays has Wi-Fi access points distributed uh, throughout facilities. Um, so, ArcGIS Indoors makes enabling Apple Indoor positioning easy, right? Indoors can easily export the data in the format that Apple needs, and ArcGIS Indoors natively understands the signal that Apple is providing to users of its devices. Uh, so I'll just give you a quick uh, overview. So let's say I'm using ArcGIS Indoors, and Omar is gonna show a lot of the data workflow. Uh, so I get a nice map put together, and partners like Safe Software uh, using their FME product and data interop are giving us the easy button to go directly from ArcGIS indoors to what Apple calls its IMDF format. So IMDF, uh, IMDF, what does that mean? Um, it means indoor mapping data format, right? So that's the, it's a GeoJSON file, right? So it's like GIS and uh, that's the format that they want. So we can upload that directly to Apple's site and once that's done, they have an application called uh, Indoor Survey. And then if you open that up, Apple publishes the, the IMDF file as a, like a floor plan that you can use to do a survey. And what, hey Pat, what is a survey? Is it like a surveyor with a, you know, a tripod and you know, a range finder and all? No, this is, uh, there's some critical requirements. You have to be a human being uh, with at least one eyeball and, and one arm and probably two legs, two legs, because you're doing a lot of walking, and you open up an application and you go, I am here, right? And if you say I'm here, you're creating correspondence between an absolute location in the world and a floor plan. And if you say I'm here, it's also taking a snapshot of the radio signature at that point, right? So it uses all that together to create correspondence information that's then downloaded to your phone d directly uh, you know, through the Apple core location technology. So it's just baked in as part of Apple's hardware. And where does the blue dot come from? It doesn't come from a server. It's actually solved on your device, right? So core location just solves it right on your device, right? So it, it gives you that, that, uh, that indoor location, right? So we do the survey, and then once we do the survey, uh, people at Apple go, that was a great survey. There were no errors in it, and we're getting great results. And then you're good to go. We're turning it on. And as soon as we turn it on, everybody that's ever existed that has an Apple device who goes to that area gets a great blue dot. But it doesn't mean they get that map, right? You, you maintain that map. That's up to you. All right. So here's an example. This is provided by our friends at Apple. Um, <laughs> so, but if you were at an Apple store, 
you know, with the positioning, it would be just like that. But I think we had some tests of this last year here. Uh, who, was anybody here who tested that with us? Okay, we do have it set up at our booth through Bluetooth. And so we can show you, at least on the Bluetooth side, how that works. And I think that the, uh, I don't think the survey's degraded too much since last year. I think it's actually fine in this area, but it may be thrown off by the, uh, the temporary access points that were set up. So you can give it a shot when you leave here, just like open it up and there's no floor plan that you can see, but you go, oh, okay, that blue dot, it looks like the circle of competence isn't so bad. All right, so with that, I wanna hand it off to my colleague, Max. And so you can, here, Max, here's my, my clicker. All right. Um, yeah, next. Oh, yep, yeah, next. I'll just, uh, before, I totally hand it over. Uh, if you do decide to do that, you register at uh, register.apple.com slash indoor. You load your site into it, right? You upload the, the IMDF file directly to this site, and, and it's all here. It's really easy to manage. And then you can set up roles and administrators, administrators surveyors, uh, you know, map makers and everything. So I can answer all these questions after. All right, so now, now yeah. it's your turn. Um, hi, everyone. Maybe a quick word of introduction, why this is a separate thing. Um, indoors, also indoors, even <laughs> despite the dot, we don't call it indoo.rs, we say indoors. No, you like that. <laughs> it makes it easier sometimes with the spelling. You have no idea how, uh, how often I had to spell my email address. Um, it's a marketing gag didn't work as well as intended. So uh, we were an independent company that uh, got acquired by Esri in spring. And we're more and more integrating the stuff that we have, but some people are, uh, not people, some things are a little redundant because we just had to have our own maps in the beginning. So there are still some processes that um, can be streamlined a bit more. But basically, I'm gonna give you a brief introduction on how our IPS system works. I think we can right away right. jump to the next one. So basically, you have an infrastructure. Ours is based on, um, we're generally with our algorithms, um, hardware agnostic, so we can work with Wi-Fi, we can work with beacons, we could theoretically apply the algorithms to any other kind of uh, radio signal, um, but since you wanna run it on a smartphone, um, the most common are just Bluetooth and Wi-Fi. Um, and Wi-Fi is Android only because we, as a third party, cannot access the Wi-Fi data in a way that we would need on iPhones. But um, for that case, we have the Apple positioning system that Pat just showed. And then there are some web tools that you need for authoring, account management, and so on and so on. Uh, and obviously the mobile. And um, I think worth mentioning is that the IPS as with Apple, runs completely offline on the device. You don't necessarily need to have an internet connection or anything. You just need to have uh, your map file mm -hmm. downloaded, integrated in an app, um, and then you're good to go. You don't need any internet. You can use that in a tunnel where there's no cell reception whatsoever. Um, right. Runs on the device. Yeah, that's um, the, the process that we usually go when we are setting up the indoor positioning system. I think we can uh, just very briefly, or just go to the next yeah, slide. Next slide. So um, it all starts with a map. This uh, is getting tremendously easier now that we're... <laughs> well, that's one of the big updates. <laughs> exactly. so, so right now we give you, we, exactly. send, we send the team in uh, Vienna, Austria, uh, map package, yeah. right? You take the map package and you make images because that was the process exactly. that was used in, in the Vienna uh, in, at Indoors the, before they were acquired. Uh, so the development roadmap is to just work directly off exactly. of Esri Maps. So for so. now, we need to work with uh, pretty simple image files yeah. uh, in order to create our maps. Uh, obviously, we have much more powerful tools for yeah. that available now. Yeah. But um, So if, if you were to work with us or one of our partners and you wanted to turn this on, uh, you'd create a map or we'd create a map for you. Our partner would create a map on your behalf. We'd send that map to these guys. They would uh, create the images they, the way they need to from that map and then load that into their, their system. Exactly. Um, yeah, I was on the slide before, oh, and sorry. it doesn't matter, it's fine. Uh, deliverables, <laughs> um, based off that map, we would usually create a beacon placement plan yeah. um, where we 
uh, recommend placing hardware um, because that's that's not a process that uh, needs to be done by by some specialist or something. Basically, once you have the plan, they just need to be sticked to the wall, and that's it. And now we can go to the next slide. Okay. Um, it's a estimate um, how long you need to to set up everything um, to get it running. So set up map or uh, set up of map in the indoors tools means uh, integrating a floor plan, georeferencing it so that you have a reference to the real world. Um, it also means adding context, mm -hmm. and a lot of that is uh, going away or moving to to just to the map to the map exactly. Yeah. So the efforts on that end on on our side are getting significantly yeah. less, and at some point it won't exist at all because it's just in indoors. And then the beacon placement. Ideally, you want to not only put them up, you also want to note where they are for maintenance and so on. Um, our estimate is that you can. With a little practice, put up around 100 beacons per man day. Um, so you get an idea when you have a large venue, you maybe need thousands of them. Um, yeah. yeah. It could take a while. It could take a while. <laughs> <laughs> That's the main downside of it, is that you, that you need the beacons. Um, comparison to Wi-Fi, maybe, uh, before, because I'm yeah. sure the question will come later on, why should we use beacons over Wi-Fi, uh, is mainly accuracy. So with beacons, um, because we have a denser grid of signals available, we can uh, get an accuracy somewhere in the range of two meters and really good setups. I think three to four is, is very realistic yeah. to achieve. And with Wi-Fi, when we're looking at some like 15, yeah. can, you, can you quickly yep. convert that to feet? Oh, <laughs> multiply by three. Multiply, yeah. All right. So uh, the beacons, I unfortunately don't have one right now with me, but uh, in the expo area there are plenty that you will yep. see. Um, they're just little boxes this size, roughly, and the easiest way to put them up, especially if it's not a permanent setup, but something like in the expo area, is just using double-sided tape, stick them up, and you're good. Yep. Um, they are highly configurable. You can configure how often they transmit. You can configure how strong they uh, transmit, and with that also the, the range. Um, typically, the range is the usable range is something different than the actual range. So uh, the, the range that we work with is something between 15, 20, maybe 30 meters, um, typically. Uh, but you want to have some overlap, because the way our technology works is that it mm -hmm. uses uh, multiple beacon signals at once to calculate the position based on a fingerprint. So I'm going to test what I remember. You, you were saying, I want to see at least three yeah. from any position that I'm at, yeah. where I'm, where I'm looking. Yeah. And that'll be different based on the density of the, the, the interior architecture. Exactly. So facility. the more complex a building, um, the more complex will, yeah. will that get. Um, good. Mm -hmm. Rule of thumb is you do not only want to have, uh, you don't only want to be able to receive three, but if you have direct line of sight to three, then you're pretty safe. Yeah. All right. So, so we just yeah, that's some, so there some are rough yeah. guidelines. What we typically end up with, as I said, it depends a lot on the complexity. Um, an office typically has rather narrow spaces, corridors that go around corners, et cetera, et cetera. So uh, on average, you can cover 25 square meters, which roughly translates to 250 square feet with one beacon. Um, in retail, that's a similar scenario. You might have shelves uh, in the way. You need to uh, walk down corridors, et cetera. Shopping malls are way more open spaces. Um, so you maybe have a lobby or something, um, and that's where this bigger number is coming from. Mm -hmm. One beacon can uh, cover a lot more space when you have uh, no corners to walk around or something. Next one. Yeah, I think it, it makes sense how this goes on. Then site survey, I mentioned the word fingerprinting before. Um, it's essentially very similar to what Apple does. Uh, I think our tools even look almost the same. Yeah. Um, because that's just how fingerprinting works. Um, a fingerprint is basically a signal profile at a given uh, point of a map that um, 
is referenced on the map and contains a profile of every transmitter that is receivable around it. And um, the position is then calculated by a constant comparison of the uh, fingerprint database with the currently received signal profile. And based on that, the position can be relatively easily calculated. And in order to get that fingerprint uh, map, a site survey is done where uh, recordings are taken, measurements um, of the signal profiles everywhere in the area. Then we put that into our server, which yeah. is called SLAM. Yep. Um, so in the beginning, when we started doing this, you had to uh, stop every few steps take a measurement, walk a few steps, take a measurement, walk a few steps, and each of those measurements was uh, 15 seconds or so. So you can imagine that a larger venue would take forever. Um, with SLAM, we are able to just walk around, uh, record the data as we go, and the server will take care of generating the fingerprints from a recording like yeah. that. So I think the next slide has a... Yeah, here you can see a walking path uh, slam the building. Yeah, exactly. Use Slam Engine to record the fingerprint data. As I said, you take a recording on site with a mobile device. Um, we use typically Android. We can make it work on iPhones too. Um, Android is just easier because more accessible uh, and you can quickly put a custom app onto Android, which is not so easy, but an iPhone. Well, then we test it a little bit, and then uh, you get your indoor positioning yeah, system delivered. The yeah, that's the delivery. And uh, yeah, then there is the blue dot, and you can do all the nice things with it that yeah. all indoors of them. does. Yeah, <laughs> all of them. All of them. <laughs> all right. Thank you, Max. All right, so I'm going to hand it off to Omar. Sorry, Omar, we kind of squeezed your time a little bit. Okay. So let's, can you switch that to, you're on four, right? Yes. So I guess feel free to, to uh, I guess hit the highlights. So we, we'll For make sure. the slides available to everyone that has the full content that we planned. I've, we may have tried to pack too much into this one. Yeah, so I think I have like seven minutes so we can have five minutes of questions, okay. but I think we can cover most of this. So, you know, Pat talked a lot about what uh, indoors looks like. One of the, one of the things that we, we didn't get to mention a lot is the what are the tools that come with ArcGIS uh, indoors for Pro, right? So we're going to be talking about two things today. One is how, how do you, what, what is kind of like a, a high-level overview of your uh, the workflow to get your CAD or your BIM or whatever you're going to be using into the actual application. And then we're going to review uh, or go over some of these new models that we've created on in case you don't have any 3D information like BIM or, or anything like that from a 2D, from your 2D levels, details, and um, units, which we're going to talk about in a second. You can make some pretty nice 3D data with um, some of the, the models that we've been working with. Um, right, so yeah, that's kind of what I talked about. So the, the, the three tools that uh, I'm going to go over, there are a couple of other tools and they do uh, some smaller things, but the three main ones that I wanted to focus on today is the, uh, the, the geoprocessing tools that create the ArcGIS indoors information model, the uh, uh, indoor, um, the CAD to uh, features class, right? So like that's the actual tool that gets your CAD into um, indoor feature classes, and then the, the last one is the network creation tools. Right, so this one's pretty simple. It, it basically creates your, uh, the information model that the rest of ArcGIS indoors is going to be using, right? Everything from the way it searches, the way the network uh, gets, gets utilized, everything like that is, is off of this um, uh, AIM schema. Right, the, the second one is your CAD to indoor feature classes. So this is kind of, uh, in, in working with a lot of this data, I feel like this is a, kind of the biggest or most important tool that we have because it actually takes, it's kind of like the meat of, of the, the tools that, that we're using. It's taking your CAD to, your, uh, to an actual indoor GIS feature class, right? So this could be two different things that, that could be used. This could be the CAD floor plans that you may have for your uh, organization or your different clients. And then the other one is BIM, right? So if you do only have BIM, we can slice that up and those turn into CAD floor plans. If you only have um, you know, paper maps or PDFs, stuff like that, then we can work with you on turning those into CAD floor plans and then 
running them through the tools. So just a couple of quick things that we, we've seen when working with some of this data that the cat should be well organized. So what does that mean? Uh, one of them is consistency, right? So my colleague Grady's back there and he's, he's probably gonna talk to me about how important is the idea of both internal consistency, so you, all your buildings being called the same things and then between buildings, everything being called the same thing. So, um, you know, for example, if a, a, we see a lot of CAD that, is, that says like A, dash door, that's good, door, doors, dory, whatever, that starts to get a little bit <laughs> difficult to, to organize, right? Proper annotation can also be really, really, well, is very important because if you have a, uh, you know, a campus with 10,000 offices and they're not annotated, someone's gonna have to go in there and annotate them and hopefully that's not you. Um, that has to go ahead and do that. It may adhere to a national standard. You know, we're kind of fans, or I guess we're not fans. We were, no, I don't want to say that. We're not fans of anybody. One, one example, right? There doesn't, it doesn't really matter what the standard is. It could be called A dash door, or it could be called, you know, door C, whatever. As long as, as, long as, as they're it's all called, you know, yeah. door C, that's what it is, yeah. right? Um, but some of these standards can just help you uh, kind of get your own CAD in, in, in like a good format. This is just one example of the American Institutes of Architect that, that I pulled up. Um, so what, is this, what does the tool require? This is what the tool looks like. It's not that you know, menacing. You put in your input workspace, which is your AIM database that we just showed you a second ago. Your CAD uh, data that, you know, the, actually, I'm kind of misspeaking, the Excel template will point to where your CAD is, is living. And the Excel template file is basically a, an Excel sheet that or, is organized and you tell the tool, this, this is what doors are, this is what walls are, this is what, what um, you know, and this is where our files are living, go work on it, right? So it spits out something like this, uh, that's an actual, you know, feature class with this AIM schema baked into it. So my personal favorite one, I just really like the network tools for some reason, if I, if I had to do both of those, or either of those processes, I like the network one, just it feels more fun. But basically what it's doing is, is generating a lattice on pre-network features. You thin them based on the points of interest that you want to route to, right? So the lattice will land all over your indoor feature classes, but if you don't want to route to say the uh, you know, nuclear waste container storage, you can you know, you know, cut that out and then you create your final network. Right, so this uses ArcGIS, and then users can use your ArcGIS Pro to test your network results. And by test, I mean making sure that you want the network to reach everywhere that it wants to, that you want it to go to. So what does this look like, right? You could exclude, so you have your in, input workplace, right? So that's the AIM database that we showed you a second ago. The, the detailed type field, so we're saying, you know, our detail barriers are gonna be things like columns, like exterior walls, like glass walls, like you know, unless you want your users walking through glass walls, you want to put that in there, and just regular walls, unless you guys have staff that can trans, you know, like, can go through, break the laws of physics and can walk through doors, you don't have to put that in there, but, and that lets the lattice know where it's not going to, uh, to, um, to put down a, a network. The network density just basically, it tells you how small or how dense the network is going to be, and that's mostly for doors. As you're working through some of your data, you're, you may want to know, you may know that 0.5 is the best one for your particular campus. Uh, if the doors are really big, you know, like for a big conference center or something like that, then the network density can be a little bit bigger. And that's bit meters. Bigger. And meters, yeah. correct. Uh, you could also use restricted unit types. So like I mentioned earlier, the nuclear waste holding facility, you don't want to put a, 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 a a network through there, you can leave that out. And then the other really nice thing about the tools is that you can do it by facility or by level or by building and floor, right? So we're using facility as building and level as floor. So you could say, well, I've already done building A, uh, that's, that network looks good, but network B had some you know, things that we need to tinker with, let's just do building B and run the tool. So yeah, kind of mentioned all this. You end up getting something that looks like this, so as you can tell the barriers or the walls don't have a lattice over them, but our network density, see like these little yellow areas, our network density was small enough that our network was able to crawl in there, right? So you then create floor transitions, and this is a you know, fairly simple step where you select areas like elevators or your stairways, um, and the, the tool also allows you to delete existing features, so there's a, you know, there's like an elevator that got created twice, you can delete it and run it again, uh, and then you end up looking something like this. Just one quick note, 
the staircases that actually look like staircases are uh, for this release of indoors, someone has to edit and manually do that, that, um, that stairway if you want it to look like that for routing and symbology purposes. And these vertical ones would be the elevators. And then uh, finally, in your network processing, uh, um, yeah, in, your, in your process, you would thin the, the, the different, the, the, the network to ensure that it's only reaching points of interest that you're telling it to go to, right? So routable locations could be anything from your office, bathrooms, and excluding anything that you don't want it to go. Right, and you end up with something like this. So it looks more like a, kind of like a computer circuit and you're being routed to where you need to go and this is a 3D uh, version um, of that, right? So you're checking to make sure that it reaches everywhere. So since I'm kind of limited in time, I just want to go over this really quickly. Um, if you don't have any 3D data, you, there's only three things that you would need to do with some of the models that we've been working on, and they're not released yet, but they're hot off the presses. If you saw the Exxon Mobil demonstration, at the very end there were some 3D visualizations, and we did that with, with these different processes. And all you need basically is your details, your levels, and your units. And in doing so, you can take something that looks like this, and I'm gonna go kind of fast, I apologize, but you're ba through a series of kind of, we're slicing and dicing, creating buffers and negative buffers, applying CGA rules, and symbolizing your results. Um, you can create the 3D floor plates where the units and the walls are gonna sit, the actual walls themselves, the 3D units, and uh, 3D doors, right? So I'm gonna go through this kind of quickly. Uh, oh, one quick thing that I just wanted to show is what, um, you know, you can use some of expressions if you only want to do offices for a particular kind of unit, sorry, 3D units for a, a particular kind of unit, like say conference rooms or, or actual offices, and exclude, say, bathrooms for whatever reason. Um, the model looks like this, so like, I make it, again, I don't have time to go into detail with this, but you're kind of slicing, dicing, adjusting Z values so that your 3D uh, looks good, and you can go from you know, floor plates, the actual walls themselves, to what we think looks like some pretty spiffy looking units, looks in, good. in my opinion. Uh, how about some doors? Yes, we do have doors that you could go in there. It just makes it look a lot nicer. And uh, really quickly, here is a scene for um, the, the ExxonMobil campus that we had that ends up looking like this. So this is, this is visualizing 3D units. There's transparency applied to this, so they look like little jello molds. Um, and this is being visualized by office use type right here. And this is the whole campus all in 3D. And if you zoom in, then you can see our, our little fancy 3D doors right there that look That's like great. So yeah. Yeah, that looks really great. Well, that was fast. Did you, did you guys like that? I thought that looked pretty good. Um, I, I want to show one thing. Sure. Uh, oh, yes. So it's not just us doing this. Uh, and I know if you have to run, you got to run. We got one minute, so I want to show you. <clears throat> three, um, right, Pat? Mm -hmm. Huh? Three, yes. Yeah. Uh, three minutes or whatever. Yeah, I mean, you're on number three. So. I'm on number three, okay. yeah. So let me duplicate my monitor and put this in. Sorry, we'll get it eventually. If I can, here we go. Oh. Ah, so, um, so we work with a number of customers and this particular customer is doing it themselves, which I think is awesome. And so we've been working with them for how long now? Like over a year? Mm -hmm. And apparently it wants me to do a time card right in the <laughs> middle of a presentation. <laughs> nice. Um, so we'll go back to that, and sorry about that in interruption. Um, so let's say I want to look for a particular building. We're going to look for Memorial Chapel. And, uh, and so we can even map, uh, you know, so they, they've even mapped some of the interiors of their buildings here. And they have great information. Like, uh, I mean, look at the, the pictures and, and the pop-up windows and, you know, the connected uh, uh, related items. I guess my, my connection's a little, this is that icon I was talking about earlier. If you don't like the default icon, you can change it. Um, you can also do uh, directions. So you, you're, you're a Harvard guy, where should I go from here? 
Uh, probably to the GSD. I'm not sure if that's on the network, but okay, graduate really? school design. Okay, uh, graduate. Do I type in Gund Hall or graduate? Uh, yeah, sorry, you can put it Gund Hall. Yeah. yeah. Uh, so I can is. type in Gund Hall. And then, uh, so it's the directions are already in here. And I didn't know you, you guys are gonna put this in here. This is awesome, so. So I can, uh, I can even go 3D. That was actually my route, going from church to uh, oh, the GSD. To okay. After, you know, I think this is beautiful. From... I don't know. It's, you guys did a great job, so. Um, I mean, everything's in here. So, uh, like, explore, explorers set up based on how they view the world. Like I can go into the galleries and, and see all the galleries, uh, for example. I mean, it looks it looks really good. And then even events are set up based on, mm -hmm. you know, what what's going on now. So I don't know. I think it looks great. So, yeah. So I just wanted to show everybody that. All right, and that's it. We're out of time. Uh, we'll be here for questions, and feel free to stop by the booth to get in more into the 3D and ask us any more uh, follow-up questions. Yeah, if you're really interested in looking at so, oh. what some of the models are doing, then we're at the 3D booth. To, I mean, the, sorry, the indoors, RGS indoors booth till, and, you know, 4 today. And don't forget to say what you thought of the presentation, so go to the, uh, the app, the events app, and, uh, you know, uh, look up our, our particular presentation and, and give us a rating. So I'm going to... If you don't know where that is, I'm going to plug back in and, and show you that. So. All right. Thanks, everybody. Have a great day.